I'm delighted to welcome you to a lecture by two of our most valued research colleagues, Parag Pathak and David Autor, both of the MIT Economics Department. Uh, as you can imagine, they are recipients of honors and authors of papers too numerous to mention. Um, but for example, from 2007 to 2009, Parag was a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows. And the Harvard website explains that 10 promising scholars are selected each year to pursue their studies in any department of the university, free from formal requirements. They must have exceptional ability, originality, and resourcefulness. They take no examinations, make no reports, receive no course credit. They must, however, attend weekly lunches and dinners. <laughs> so with this kind of free-form open education background, you won't be surprised that Parag has a deep interest in school choice, but also in areas such as housing markets, financial markets, risk management. Uh, he has already managed to have three publications of the American Economic Review in a two-year period. Daphne Kenyon, an economist on our staff, said, when people hear that at the lunch, they're just going to want to slit their wrists. <laughs> and I said, well, don't worry. We have such biodegradable, compostable, bamboo-based utensils that that would be the equivalent of trying to jump out of the first floor with <laughs> David has an equally impressive range of interests and achievements. Uh, he's written on human capital and earnings inequality, the effect of computers on the job market. He is editor-in-chief of the Journal of Economic Perspectives, which was established by the American Economic Association to provide accessible, policy-relevant, state-of-the-art economic things. So this is not a state economics journal. And there are no invertibility of non-parametric stochastic demand functions here. If you open the 2009 issue, you see red light states. Who buys online adult entertainment? <laughs> so you know this is a different kind of journal. But as soon as you see the first subheading, you know it is an academic journal because it asks, why study online adult entertainment? <laughs> so we're definitely still in academia. <laughs> so it feels almost improved to have David and Parag here together today. I mean, if a meteorite were to hit the Lincoln Institute, I feel like a huge swath of future economic research would be wiped out. <laughs> They're both members of the National Bureau of Economic Research, which you may know it's um, similar to the Starship Enterprise and being at once extremely impressive and often cloaked in mystery. <laughs> and we are delighted that they have made it possible for us to collaborate with them and with the NBER on the research that is the topic of today's lecture. It is the end of rent control in Cambridge effects on the housing market. Please welcome Parag and David. Um, well, Joan, thanks, thanks for that wonderful uh, introduction. It's wonderful to be back uh, at the Lincoln Institute. Um, and I'm still very grateful for the chance you guys took on me when I was uh, a graduate student a few years ago. Uh, David uh, Otter is my colleague on this project. He's sitting in the front row, but we all are also working with a, a first-rate graduate student at MIT, Christopher Palmer, who's um, sitting in the um, fourth row. And we have a, a team of researchers um, working on, on these issues, uh, including Melanie Wasserman, who's um, sitting here. So what, what we want to think about in this paper is the general topic of housing market spillovers. Um, and our starting point uh, for this project is uh, the idea that externalities are a central uh, feature of urban e economics. So uh, not only theoretically, but empirically, uh, researchers look at things like agglomeration externalities, congestion externalities. And what we wanted to think about here is residential housing market spillovers. So wh what do we mean in particular? Uh, is it the case that the maintenance of the properties next door to you uh, or the types of residents who live next door to you might have an impact on the valuation of uh, your own house. Um, and if so, then how should we think about housing market policy? Do we want to have standards uh, uh, in neighborhoods? Uh, do we want to have policies to um, affect the allocation of tenants to, to housing? And uh, rent control, um, in particular, might affect both of these channels. So they, rent control might, uh, in principle, lead landlords to maintain their properties at a, to a different degree than 
they would in an uh, unregulated market. Rent control also uh, might have an impact on who gets to live in controlled housing and who lives uh, uh, um, in <coughs> particular places. Uh, if a tenant uh, is, for instance, unruly and the landlord wants to uh, have a, a different occupant uh, rent out the place to someone else, they may have to go through different procedures, like talk to a rent control board. Oops. Um, <laughs> we start later. And uh, <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do in this paper is uh, study the effects of the end of rent control <coughs> in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1995. So one thing that's particularly exciting about this project is that we are in Cambridge, Massachusetts right now. So uh, <laughs> I wasn't here during this time period when rent control went away. Uh, some of you were. I think David uh, was uh, in graduate school at that time period. Uh, so we're very eager to hear any comments you may have on um, what it was like uh, during that time period um, and whether we got uh, some of the institutional uh, features uh, incorrect. So let me just give you a little bit more context. Now, rent control is an issue that we teach our first-year students uh, in economics. It's the textbook issue of uh, a price control. And uh, what we could find the first time rent control was uh, analyzed by economists was in the aftermath of World War II, a lot of urban areas uh, decided that rent control would be a good policy to deal with uh, housing market shortages. So a lot of troops came back. Um, and some arguments that were articulated um, at that time um, are what I have on this slide here. So um, one uh, kind of economic view given by Milton Friedman and George Stigler uh, reads as follows. Rent ceilings cause haphazard and arbitrary allocation of space inefficient use of space, retardation of new construction, formal rationing by a public authority would probably make matters still worse. Now, since the uh, post-war period, rent control as a policy <coughs> has uh, become less common, uh, but it's still present in, in some urban areas. My sister actually lives in a rent-controlled apartment in New York City. Uh, there's over a million uh, um, rent-controlled or rent-stabilized uh, units in New York. Other urban areas in the United States still have uh, rent control, like San Francisco and, and Washington. Uh, as a policy, rent control is still uh, on um, the table in discussions about affor affordable housing. So um, recently there's been some activity in Albany, New York, thinking about bringing rent control uh, to the uh, city to deal with the current recession. Uh, and it's still quite widespread in Europe and in Scandinavian countries. Now, price controls as a general issue are present in many other markets. We have things like minimum wages. We have regulations on the prices of alcohol, gasoline, uh, cigarettes. But we think housing markets might be unique, uh, in particular, the extent to which the externalities or spillovers might matter. Um, so um, <coughs> now, the discussion on rent control mostly uh, has been uh, a theoretical discussion. So um, the issues that are discussed by many uh, uh, people, starting from Friedman and Stigler's quote, uh, to what we teach in our Econ 101 classes are that rent control might have the following types of effects. So rent control might affect the quality or the quantity of rental housing. Um, indeed, there the price control might uh, lead to too few uh, units being produced or supplied or the, the supplied units having low quality. Uh, the second thing that's often discussed in the theoretical side uh, on rent control is that since a price is not determining who gets the housing, uh, the particular allocation mechanism, the allocation scheme, could lead to um, uh, the prevention of gains from trade from being realized. So um, people might live in uh, places that they wouldn't otherwise live in because they're getting a, a subsidized rent. Um, and uh, the third po uh, point that's often discussed is this point on spillovers or externalities. <laughs> um, it's possible that uh, Rent control leads to some uh, differences in maintenance uh, or uh, undesirable tenants um, living nearby uncontrolled units. So rent control has these direct effects, and they, uh, it also it's possible that it has these um, uh, indirect effects. And so what we're particularly interested in this paper is thinking about the indirect effects, uh, or the, what we call the spillover effects. So um, what we uh, like about uh, uh, Cambridge is that uh, it's a very unique episode, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So what we're going to do in this project, we've put together uh, various uh, data sets on rent control, uh, on the extent of rent control, uh, transactions of properties, uh, investment data, uh, 